Okay, this is the start of our uh, annual uh, series on uh, leadership recalls in which we interview uh, leaders within ASHRAE and within our heating, ventilating, air conditioning, refrigeration industry. Uh, the first uh, uh, interview is about to start now is Gerald C. Groff. Uh, he is a, a long-time uh, participant in this industry and in, uh, worked for a number of major companies and currently is functioning as uh, in his own consulting business, Gerald Groff Associates. Start our interview off by ask, asking you if you give us a little bit of background on your uh, years of experience and uh, uh, what have you found most interesting in heating, ventilating, and air conditioning? Uh, actually, I guess uh, when you have been involved with the industry as long as I have, uh, there's no little background. There's usually a lot of background. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my case, it uh, my introduction to the air conditioning, heating, ventilating, and refrigeration industry came uh, as when I was a student at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, the University of Minnesota was a very strong institution in uh, a number of areas related to heating and ventilating, uh, one of the more notable ones being uh, its activity as a source of information on uh, the thermal conductivity of materials and the uh, U-values associated with various types of construction. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, at the, as an undergraduate and as a, subsequently as a graduate student, I think I had something like 15 or 16 courses in the heating, ventilating, air conditioning, refrigeration area. Minnesota was on a quarter system, so those would translate into a few less uh, in terms of a normal university program. But nevertheless, I think it uh, is indicative of the type of training that was available to young engineering students related to our industry back in those times. And this was in the 1952 to 1955, 56 period. I was very fortunate that I had some wonderful faculty members at the University of Minnesota uh, who became my faculty advisors. These included gentlemen like Axel Aubrin, Claire Lund, Roy Threlkeld, uh, Richard Jordan, who was head of the department, all of whom were really important contributors and pioneers uh, to research in our industry and as practitioners of the arts and sciences of air conditioning and refrigeration. Uh, as a, an undergraduate, Minnesota at the time was a five-year engineering school, but if you had adequate grades, it was possible to uh, take a bachelor's degree in engineering at the end of four years and start graduate work early. And I, I took advantage of that option and then became a graduate student and teaching assistant working under uh, those faculty members uh, for the fifth year that I was in school. And during that time I had the chance to teach some laboratory courses in refrigeration and air conditioning, which were, was really quite a helpful uh, experience for me. I then left the university, I was a, in the Naval ROTC and spent three years on active duty um, and I had a rather interesting job. I was with the U.S. Navy Civil Engineer Corps, which is probably best known as the group that the Seabees are involved with. But in my case, my assignments were involved in construction management. And so I spent three years on Whidbey Island in Washington State uh, supervising major military construction projects. Included in those were a number of air conditioning installations and buildings, so I was able to continue my interest in the field at that time. In uh, 
June of 1959, I returned from the Navy uh, to complete my graduate work at Minnesota. And during the following year, I had the opportunity not only to work with the refrigeration and air conditioning faculty, but also with a what had um, become an important part of the program while I had been away, a heat transfer department under the leadership of Dr. Ernst Eckert, who was one of the leading German uh, scientists who had joined uh, the faculty here in the United States following World War II. And as a consequence of those experiences, I was uh, recommended by my graduate advisor to uh, Carrier Corporation uh, in the spring of 1960 uh, for a special assignment to work as the assistant to Carlisle Ashley. Carl was nearing retirement. At the time he was Carrier Corporation's chief staff engineer and they had determined that it would be useful to have a young person uh, join the company to work with Carl uh, preceding his retirement in the hopes that some of the experience and knowledge that he had gained as a pioneer in the industry would rub off on them and they would maintain some sense of continuity of this knowledge within the company. I'm not sure that happened, but nevertheless, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for a young engineer, and I was pleased to take advantage of it. So with that, we moved to Syracuse, New York, and I became Carl's assistant. <coughs> there were a couple of interesting things going on in the industry at that particular time. One was the, uh, an effort on the part of ASHRAE to adopt a new psychrometric chart. And this was a rather interesting experience for me because there was one competitive chart being uh, put forth by Roy Threlkeld, who was my graduate advisor in Minnesota, and I was very familiar with his work. When I got to Carrier, there were two gentlemen putting forth uh, uh, proposed charts. Uh, one was Carl Ashley, and the other one was E.P. Bud Palmatier. And this was uh, uh, a period in which there was a lot of debate over the exact form that the ASHRAE chart would take. So it was uh, very interesting for me to be able to see at least two sides of that issue at the time. The other thing that was going on that was uh, of importance in the industry was the issue of how to measure the sound power uh, generated from air conditioning and refrigeration equipment. And uh, Carl Ashley uh, was very much immersed in that problem when I joined, and as his assistant I became also immersed in it very quickly. And I think here a little anecdote on the background of air conditioning sound, uh, and Carl in particular, might be of value. Uh, Early after joining Carrier, I discovered a photograph of Carl as a younger person uh, sitting at a table with this uh, quite crude looking instrument. And so I asked him what that was all about and it turned out to be a sound level meter. And Carl went on to explain to me that noise became an issue for the air conditioning equipment back about 1931 when talking movies first came into being. And up to that point in time, uh, the intense heat generated by lights on a movie set were handled by large cooling fans and various types of, of means to uh, mitigate the heat from the lights. But when talking pictures came in, this cooling equipment was far too noisy and intruded into the soundtrack, so there was a, a, um, a, a, an intense effort made to try to find some more quieter way of handling this. And Carl worked on that problem back in that period, and uh, as a part of that work, he joined with a... Um, a, a, a electrical engineering doctor from Boston, 
who later founded the General Radio Company, and together they developed the first sound level meter. By the time I got to Carrier, uh, our challenge was a little bit different. It was what form should the testing procedures take that would be used to measure the sound from this type of equipment. And there were two, again, competitive approaches being considered. One was the measurement of the sound pressure level in an anechoic room, the very super quiet rooms, uh, which involves some mathematical computations then to compute the power generated from the equipment. And the other approach is what was called the reverberation room method. And in that approach, uh, the equipment would be set up and operated in a very hard acoustical environment with the um, idea that you would try to get all of the sound generated from the equipment uh, radiated out into the space where it would uh, reverberate, create a diffuse sound field, and then microphones could be moved through the field to average the, the power level. So my job when I first joined Carrier was in doing a, a, a number of studies, comparing these methods, attempting to develop uh, actual uh, practical techniques for doing it, and as a side project, I was asked, by the way, would I do some work to try and make the room air conditioners that were being produced by the company a bit quieter. So uh, one of my first tasks was to create a, a, uh, a simulated uh, wall of a residence and uh, work on a room air conditioner and attempt to, to quiet its operation. So I worked with Carl for a while on a wide variety of problems because Carl was really a generalist. He was a, a very special person. Uh, he had been the first person hired by Carrier to do research. He was hired at the age of 16 in 1916, mm -hmm. subsequently left to go to college, and then came back and joined the company at a later date. And through his entire career, Carl's would be characterized best by being a person of intense curiosity. He also happened to be the uh, person who designed the first condensing residential gas-fired furnace and the first line of residential uh, air conditioning equipment. After Dr. Carrier had come to the conclusion that Providing engineering services would not be a long-term success for the company, but they would really have to have a line of products that they would sell. In my own case, after working with Carl, I continued to work for Carrier for 27 years, spent almost all of that time in the research and development area, uh, moving from research engineer to research group leader to research manager and ultimately to director of Carrier's Research and Development Laboratories, a position I held from 1968 to 1974. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 1978 to 1984. In 1984, the and I was asked to take a special assignment and spend some time uh, helping to plan how the company would coordinate its engineering activities worldwide. And that was a very interesting year because I had the chance to visit a number of other companies, both U.S. companies and foreign companies, to look at the way in which they coordinated engineering activity. Following that, I was asked to move to Europe to be Carrier's Director of Technology and also of Product Management. Carrier had acquired several companies in Europe and was interested at that time in beginning to do product development for the foreign markets in the, in the, own, in the zone in which they would be sold. So I had a <coughs> 
an interesting assignment and period of time there working with these various companies. Uh, and I returned to the U.S. in 1987. And later that year, left Carrier and uh, took an assignment as director of solar research at the Solar Energy Research Institute in Golden, Colorado. The institute is now called NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And uh, while I enjoyed the position very much and had responsibility for a number of the government's renewable energy programs, uh, during that period of time I was invited to come back to the Syracuse area where we had lived for a long time and to take a position as president of a German privately owned manufacturing company. The company's name is Marquardt Switches and I was responsible through that company for the company's uh, activities in North America which included manufacturing, design, and the uh, sale of the uh, the Marquardt products. Uh, the Marquardt products included switches and switching assemblies used in household appliances, air conditioning equipment, uh, power tools, and automotive systems. And that became really quite an interesting position. Um, I was with the company 11 years until my retirement. During that time we managed to uh, increase the sales in North America by more than a factor of four, uh, made a little money in the process, and uh, for me it was really a very nice end to a professional career in that I was able to apply to a smaller company. A lot of the learning and hopefully many of the um, uh, ideas of handling people that I had learned in working for the larger corporation as long as I had. So I completed that tour in 1999 and since that time I have been spending most of my time back with interests that I had developed early on in my career working with ASHRAE, with the International Institute of Refrigeration and with the International Energy Agency's um, uh, heat pump technology programs. And I'm continuing to do this today. I serve as a consultant to the Department of Energy, mostly on international programs, and I have had the chance to participate uh, in a number of international activities. For 11 years, I served as the chairman of an international oversight committee, and uh, I have been involved in the organization of some international conferences, including one that we will be holding this spring uh, for the heat pump program. Well, that's very helpful. We uh, certainly have a, a be much better understanding of your background, and very helpful to uh, understand the depth of it. The, uh, there are some other thoughts we'd like to get from you. Uh, understand how you came into the heat, HVAC industry uh, uh, at the college level, but the, how did you decide to take the candle into the uh, uh, A very interesting question. Uh, like a lot of young people, uh, in high school uh, I was not very clear on what type of career I was interested in pursuing. I envy greatly those who had a clear-cut idea of what mm -hmm. they wanted to do. So I think primarily through a reliance on the things that I seemed to be able to do best, which were science and mathematics, um, mm -hmm. I, I was steered by uh, my faculty in high school and advisors toward the engineering profession. Uh, everyone seemed to think at that time that this was a great field of work for those who mm -hmm. were qualified to do it. And um, I really didn't focus on mechanical engineering per se until I think my freshman or sophomore year in college. Mm -hmm. uh, those first 
years, you're taking a variety of basic courses, and I think I found the mechanical engineering courses a little more to my liking and ability than some of the others. Thank you. The, uh, you pretty well covered the industry in some depth, but the point was that uh, it was specifically as how it related to you, but how did uh, how was the industry as far as an overall uh, picture to you at that time? Did you see as you came out into the, into the business side of, the, of your life, did you see a good future there and, uh, and uh, something of interest and, and challenge? I think that it, in those earlier times, um, the role of an engineer in our industry and the industry itself were remarkably different than they are today. Um, at that time, engineering as a profession, I think, was uh, was perhaps viewed as a much more honorable uh, goal in itself than perhaps it is today. Uh, being an engineer was a a, uh, a very honorable uh, job to be undertaking. Working for a large company with an engineering department was a very attractive thing to do. I think we took it for granted that the uh, financial rewards associated with that would come naturally if you were doing your job well and if you were learning and growing. Uh, in my own case, I elected to go back to school. Uh, I had received both a bachelor's in and master's degree in mechanical engineering at Minnesota. And after I uh, moved to Syracuse, after a, a few years at Carrier, uh, I went back to school and uh, finally completed uh, what we would call a technical MBA. The uh, formal title was a uh, master's degree in engineering administration. But I uh, was very much interested in not just doing the research and engineering work, but in being in a position where you would be participating in the planning of the activity and in the administration of it as well. And um, I think most of us would say we didn't really plan to be managers, it kind of just happened and usually it happens if you have some uh, acumen and, and abilities in that area that are recognized by others. Um, so at that time there were a number of major companies manufacturing air conditioning and refrigeration products, each of which had large engineering staff. And uh, the industry was a, uh, it was a, provided a number of jobs every year to graduating engineers. And it was, a, I think there was an important um, growing up process in the companies where mm -hmm. each generation provided mentoring and counseling to the next generations and uh, that proceeded to individuals who had been with these companies for long periods of time. In fact, when I joined Carrier, there were a number of people who I worked in closely with that had been um, associates of Willis Carrier although Willis Carrier had, had uh, actually died before I entered college, but there was still a very strong uh, Willis Carrier um, uh, presence within the company. And that provided an incentive to the younger people to, to want to grow and to learn and to achieve um, uh, and be able to contribute as his predecessors did. Uh, I think through particularly the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, that tended to disappear from many of the companies, uh, perhaps in conjunction with some other industry forces. Uh, there began the consolidation of activities and the number of companies began to uh, be reduced as companies would join together and the industry took on much more a, I think, a financial management uh, uh, point of view 
Um, in the past, there had been traditionally engineers as presidents and CEOs of those companies. And that shifted, I think, during that period of time. And as I say, the, the uh, stock market prices and other things began to take uh, play a much larger role in the orientation of the companies. I think today it's uh, quite a little different thing. First of all, I think today we see that there are fewer college level programs uh, oriented towards training engineers who would work in the air conditioning refrigeration field. It's left more to the employers, the consulting engineering firms and others, to provide that type of, of specific training and background. Um, Actually, the engineers, number of engineers employed by the large manufacturing companies has diminished greatly, again, both through continued consolidation in the number of companies and also in the type of activity that those companies engage in. So it's quite a little different uh, activity today. and. Uh, I think the industry is suffering somewhat because we don't have the continuity of a chain of, of uh, recruitment, a consistent recruitment program on the part of young engineers and also to the means by which they are mentored and trained uh, as they grow in the engineering field. And I believe that we see some of the uh, ramifications of that within ASHRAE and uh, the change in the complexion of the ASHRAE membership that has occurred over these years. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings up the ASHRAE for our next subject. When did you join ASHRAE? I joined ASHRAE um, as I was, uh, just as I was graduating from the university mm -hmm. um, as an associate member because I had had my, uh, a strong, um, involvement in the field through my coursework, uh, I was encouraged by my professors to become interested in the society. Um, certainly they were all active in ASHRAE and uh, it was uh, more or less uh, brought, to, brought to our attention that this was what one did if you were going to be a, a true professional in, in the field. And that was reinforced greatly when I got to Carrier because, of course, walking up and down the halls at Carrier where we pass the offices of the people whose technical papers uh, we had been studying and referring to for some time. So it was somewhat of a who's who of ASHRAE. And in fact, I'm I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that uh, when I go to ASHRAE headquarters in Atlanta and look at the wall of the photographs of the ASHRAE presidents, hmm. I can, I have worked, um, I can say that I've worked and knew them all the way back to the second photograph on the wall, which is that of Walter Grant. Hmm. And subsequently I worked with Bill McGrath and Stan Gilman and Don Rich and Bruno Morabito and, and uh, a number of the others that were not a carrier, Chuck Sepsi and many uh, uh, of the others who are on that wall. Uh, and they have provided, I think, role models and an incentive you know, to the younger engineers uh, to follow in their footsteps. And they have, of course, all, including yourself, left a great heritage for the newer generation to build on. Okay. Well, that's a, uh, a, good, a good basis then for ASHRAE, as it was then, and it is uh, changing as we go along, of course. But nothing stays the same. No, absolutely uh, not. Uh, the, uh, well, let's see, what do you have, uh, you're presenting a paper soon, is that the case? Yes, I, actually it's, uh, I'm presenting a paper in, at a, uh, an international energy agency conference that will be held to the end of May. Uh, uh, it's the eighth international energy heat pump technology conference. 
Uh, the paper I'm presenting is a, a little bit different than what I have normally done. Uh, in planning for this conference, uh, we were looking at topics that would be uh, topics that would capture the attention and interest of a broad uh, group of participants from all over the world. And uh, one of the individuals who's with a major air conditioning company said more or less cynically, well, what somebody ought to do is to explain who uses heat pumps and why. Mm -hmm. And so we went through a little bit of a process trying to find an appropriate person who had an international perspective to do that. And in the end, uh, uh, I was asked to do that. So what I am doing is actually going back to Lord Kelvin in 1852, who first proposed the concept of a heat pump, and uh, going to talk a little bit about the heat pump uh, introductions that have occurred over a number of years and what was behind them. Uh, one of the more notable American experiences is one of a, of a very a well-known ASHRAE engineer, J. Donald Croker, mm -hmm. uh, from Portland, Oregon, who uh, employed large uh, well water source heat pumps on a famous building in Portland, Oregon, and then subsequently applied that technique to some other installations, including a very large uh, shopping mall in Minneapolis that was installed in 1956. And I was a little bit aware of that because as one of my course projects at the University of Minnesota, when that installation was being made, uh, I had an assignment to go out and talk with the engineers and uh, to bring back a report on the, on the design and uh, uh, performance expectations for that installation. What was significant about it is it was the first fully enclosed climate controlled shopping center in the world. And um, uh, there were, uh, Mr. Croker employed a number of techniques to get the maximum efficiency from the system, and it was a, really an important uh, installation. But uh, in any event, so my paper is covering the period from 1852 until the present day, and looking at heat pumps in a generic sense as to uh, what is the advantage of using them and uh, what is actually going on worldwide with that technology. Yeah, the number of heat pumps being sold per year now is up in the millions, I guess. There are probably close to 150 million installed worldwide, and uh, there are very close to 20 million a year being sold in the Far East alone. The U.S. sales are in the order of 2 million, and even Europe, which uh, who have had such a long-standing um, uh, let's say, abhorrence uh, of having air conditioning because mm -hmm. they felt it was a luxury and unhealthy and an energy consuming thing. Air conditioning is growing very rapidly in Europe and uh, mm -hmm. heat pump sales are growing even in areas where one would least expe expect them, like in Norway and in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it is actually a very uh, vibrant, robust industry at the moment. Okay. Well, I think, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close this out? I think we're about at the end of it. Uh, no, I appreciate very much the opportunity to talk a little bit about my own background, a little mm -hmm. bit about what's going on in the industry. Um, I happen to think that this industry, far from being a, a very mature and uh, perhaps stagnant place for engineers to work is today perhaps one of the most exciting places that a young engineer uh, could hang his hat. And uh, part of the rationale for that is the fact that uh, there is a, a very important world need for individuals to uh, design and apply and uh, improve energy systems 
and as a part of that, uh, building and industrial uh, refrigeration and air conditioning systems are, are an extremely important part. Uh, that is unfortunately um, compounded by the fact that there are fewer engineers who seem to find interest in the fields today. Uh, one of the reasons being that these fields of engineering have become less visible to the public. They are more supportive technologies than uh, things like uh, um, the biomedical field or others that may seem to be a little bit more exciting or the space industry. But uh, in order to, to achieve the things that people want to do in virtually every type of societal uh, endeavor, uh, there is an engineering person or persons involved with the support systems, the life support systems, the, the energy systems behind them, and that is an extremely important uh, contribution that uh, can be made. The uh, future is something we can't uh, can't pick out easily, but we can look forward and see the directions we're going and try to plan for it. Uh, and this is something that uh, actually his job is, is laid out for them there. That that's what they need to do is to help lead it, and we'll take leaders like you to uh, help guide it. No, thank you. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that. That does? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, you're more than welcome.